Don't make a plan that is what you should do. Make a plan that outlines a future so that you can sit back and say, look, if I had that future, then all the horrible things that are going to happen to me are going to be worthwhile. That's what you want. Do you want to think this game is worth playing despite its tragedy? That's what you've got in life. Enough meaning to serve as an antidote to tragedy. And then you generate a strategy. The other thing you should do if you're not very industrious is discipline yourself. Eat three times a day at regular meal times. That's a good thing to practice because that starts to put some stability into your life. Get up at the same time. I would highly recommend all those young people out there who are listening. You want to get a jump on life? Get the hell out of bed in the morning. As I've got older, I've got up earlier and earlier. Now that's partly because you don't need as much sleep, but it's also partly because I've got more and more discipline. Get up early in the morning and get your things done. Learn to get up at six in the morning and you'll be one deadly creature, especially if you can get to work. You'll have half your damn day done. And so that's a massive, massive advantage. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael and I make these videos because you are probably the most ambitious person in your circle. But you know you're capable of more and you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today let's learn from one of the best, Jordan Peterson, and my take on his top 10 was a success. Enjoy. Look, Will Ferrell, um, Warren Ferrell, not the comedian, Warren Ferrell, the author, he outlined data in Why Men Earn More, which is a book I would recommend, by the way, showing that if you work 13% longer hours, you make 40% more money. It's nonlinear. So you think, why is that? Well, imagine you had 10 employees and one of them works an extra 10 percent it's not much well how often is that person going to be promoted assuming you have a clue as a boss it's like you're going to look at the 10 people and you're going to think oh that guy's always here like 45 minutes early it's like why don't we give him the promotion obviously right so these tie these small edges that you can manage like that work an extra 10 percent or extra 13 percent have non-proportional payoffs that's part of the Pareto distribution so get get your sleep cycle organized so you get up in the morning learn how to do it no excuses i'm too tired in the morning i don't like mornings who cares that's not relevant it's like discipline yourself so you can manage it schedule your meals because that's a good disciplinary routine and then learn to use a calendar like google calendar most of you many of you out there do not use a calendar okay a calendar is not a prison and it's not a tyrant not if you use it properly a calendar keeps anxiety at bay. It makes sure that you do what you need to do, which is important because otherwise you fall behind. But if you use it properly, it also helps you plan what you want to do. So I could say, well, lay out your damn calendar and design the days you would like to have. That's what your calendar is, is for. So you can put in all sorts of things in there you want to do and that would be good for you. And that's a really good, a really good way to start being more industrious. Make a plan. You need a plan for three years. You need a plan for the next year. You need a plan for the next six months. You need a plan for the next three months. You need a plan for the week. You need a plan for the day. You need a plan for the hour. All of that. All of that. I make lists constantly of what I have to do. And they're like daily, weekly, monthly, yearly. Right now, I can't look out more than about six months, you know, because my life is too complicated and chaotic. But but you need a vision of who you could be, what character you could have. Three to five years out, you can't go much farther than that because life is too unpredictable, I think, to make vision that's longer term than that subject to... There's too, too much chance associated with it to spend a lot of time on. Maybe you can stretch it to five years, and in rare cases, you can have a 10-year goal, but it has to be pretty low resolution. But you want plans at all those levels of resolution. You want to write the things down. And what, because what are you going to do? Are you going to stumble around and get, get what you need? Are you going to stumble around and be useful to other people? And it's useful to be useful to other people, you know? They want to work with you then. They want to do things with you. They want to have you around. They trust you. They open up opportunities for you. And if you stumble around like you're blind, you're not going to get anywhere. And then you're going to suffer. And then you're going to be bitter. And then you're going to be cruel. So that's, a, that's hell. That's a bad outcome. So unless you want that, don't aim for it. And, or, or aim for the opposite, because that's how you get out of it. Rule number two, use your freedom of speech. So I would say, well, without free speech, there's no true thought. And then you might say, well, who the hell cares whether or not we think? And I think the answer to that is fairly straightforward. I mean, you might think it's so obvious that it doesn't need explanation, but there are very few things that are so obvious they don't need explanation. So 
the reason you think is so that the world doesn't smack you as hard as it might fundamentally you know and, and I really mean this technically because the way that people evolved the capacity to thought for thought was that the prefrontal cortex which mediates a lot of, of, of voluntary linguistic ability actually emerged over the course of evolutionary history out of the motor cortex and so that's a very interesting thing to understand because it means that you know animals basically think by moving and the problem with that is if you think by moving and you make the wrong move then you're dead whereas what human beings can do is they can generate fictional avatars of themselves in fictional worlds and they can run the avatars as simulations and the ones that get killed they don't express in behavior and I mean you can do that with words too although people you know originally would have done it mostly with images they do the same thing with drama and so the reason that you think and I think it was George was it Alfred North Whitehead that said this I think but I'm not absolutely sure the reason you think is so that your thoughts can die instead of you and that's a brilliant, a brilliant, brilliant phrase and, and, and absolutely the case. So if you think properly, then you kill off the ideas that if you acted out would kill you or at least cause you suffering or perhaps cause suffering to the people around you. And since it's more or less obvious a priori that suffering is worse than not suffering under most circumstances, it seems reasonable to act in a manner that will minimize it to the degree that that's possible. And so you need clarity of thought because that helps guide you through a world that's enshrouded in fog and full of sharp objects and if you don't want to stumble into them and impale yourself then you should have sharp vision and sharp capacity to communicate and, you know that's one of the things I tell students when I'm trying to teach them to write because they no one ever tells them why they should learn to write it's like you learn to write so you can think and you learn to think so that the world doesn't treat you any more harshly than it absolutely has to and that's no joke, you know, and if, you, if you're a person who's been around a bit, you see very rapidly that people who sharpen their arguments properly and can articulate their position and defend it are always, always the people who are most successful and most compelling and that, and that change the way structures function and, and that also help things continue in the proper path when they're running down the proper path. It's no joke to be articulate and to be able to think. There isn't anything that's more powerful than that. And that's a good segue into the second or the third part of what I wanted to talk to you about. You see, since I made those videos, uh, I've become, I guess the word is popular on, yeah, well, in many ways. By about November, by the end of November last year, there were more than 200 newspaper articles about the consequences of the videos that I'd produced and, I'd, and those were like in press printed articles I'm not talking about anything that happened on YouTube and YouTube is a very strange phenomenon let me tell you it's far more powerful than you think so just as an aside I was on a program last week hosted by a guy named Joe Rogan I don't know how many of you know who Joe Rogan is but Joe Rogan gets 1.2 billion downloads of his podcasts a year you just think about that, like that's absolutely unparalleled. And everybody under 30 is getting their news from either Facebook or from YouTube. And the whole conventional media sources, they're dead, as, they're so dead you can hardly believe it. So YouTube, and one of the reasons I'm bringing it up is because YouTube is the first platform that's produced for people the capacity to make the spoken word as far-reaching and permanent as the written word right that's a complete cultural revolution it's the first time it's ever happened I mean it wouldn't have to be YouTube it just turns out that that's the platform that got there first but it's a big deal and anyways um, the, re the reason that 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 my that I became popular I think was partly because of the of the political philosophical videos that I made but then when people came to my website to watch them they stayed generally speaking to watch the lectures that I had been posting on there since 2013 and uh, those were derived from work I did on a book called Maps of Meaning which I published in 1999 and you see what I was trying to do with that book was to sort something out that was very complex and that was when I was growing up and the Cold War was raging I, I couldn't understand precisely why we had divided into two armed camps around our respective ideological positions. 
either why those ideological positions were so important that people would risk the destruction of the world to protect them, let's say, or why it was those two particular ideologies, or whether or not this was just a difference of opinion. Right, which would be, that would be a more postmodern view, is there's multiple ways that you can organize societies. In the West, we happen to organize our society one way, but that's one of a plethora of potential ways of organizing society. And let's say the communists had decided to organize their society another way, and human beings are infinitely malleable, and so you know, the social structures that we occupy are arbitrary in some sense, and matter of opinion, and maybe collective opinion, but nonetheless, still a matter of opinion. And I thought, well, is it the case that the values that we hold to be true in the West are merely based upon opinion? And so I started to investigate that. And, and the conclusion that I came to as a consequence of hitting the question from multiple different perspectives was that that was not a reasonable way of formulating, of, of, of interpreting the evidence. And so I looked at neuros evidence from neuropsychology and neuroscience, mostly mostly uh, based at least in part on the work of someone named Jeffrey Gray, who was a very good psychologist, very interested in anxiety. I looked at general behavioral psychology, looked at literature, and I looked at mythology. And I could see a pattern emerging across all of those, which I think is a nice way of determining whether or not something exists. Like it's one thing to see a pattern in one set of data, but if you can see the same pattern in another set that's quite historically distinct from the first, and then see the same pattern in another set, and then another set, then the probability that that's a spurious pattern starts to decrease quite radically. Rule number three, don't underestimate others. You never want to underestimate the people that you're at war with. That's a big mistake. They're, and the, I see no evidence at all for clinical psychopathology on Putin's side, and he's Russians are complicated, and he's complicated. He is by no means the worst leader that Russia's had in the last hundred years, not by any stretch of the imagination. I'm not standing up for Putin, but I'm not going to casually demonize him. You can't take your simplistic understanding of Adolf Hitler or Joseph Stalin, which is incomplete, and then say, well, that's Putin. It's like, look, we're in trouble here. Wars tend to spread, and everyone thought when the First World War started, yeah, it'd be a few months. And then when it wasn't, they thought, well, we'll win easily. It's like, no, that isn't what's going to happen. And the people thought the same thing in World War II. And they thought the same thing in Afghanistan. And so this is a localized Ukraine-Russia conflict. Well, first of all, no, it's not. It's a war by proxy of Russia against the entire West. Obviously, now all the world isn't on board with that, but much of the world is, but not all of it. And so, you know, <laughs> you might say when your sleeve gets caught in an industrial machine and only an inch of your sleeve is in, you think, well, I've still got my whole arm. It's like, yeah, for the next 10 minutes. But don't be thinking that that's how it's gonna be in half an hour. And it'll be an absolute bloody miracle if this doesn't engulf us all. And there's a high probability of that. With all of that, all that that entails, what would it mean for the Russians to lose? Like, let's say that's what the West wants. We want Russia to lose. Okay, well, what do you mean by that, lose, exactly? Do you want the Russians to feel that they're gonna lose? They have atom bombs. What is gonna happen to a country that's already paranoid and misguided if they also think they're gonna lose you think they're just gonna lose and we're not gonna lose along with them? That's not going to happen. And so we're playing with fire on, and I think I'm, I've written an article uh, called The Civil War in the West because I think what's happening in Russia and Ukraine is a, a civil war in the West. It's just, that's just where it started. Russia's the West. And it's not just about post-Soviet territorial expansion. It's not just about oil and gas. It's definitely about those things, but it's about way more. It's about the stunning blindness and stupidity of Europe on the energy front. Who didn't know this was going to happen? Do you, who's so blind that they believed that making Europe dependent on Russian oil and gas for environmental reasons wasn't going to produce this? 
And well, we didn't know. Well, if you were a statesman and you didn't know that, you are so incompetent that it defies comprehension because that's so self-evident. And so now we're in that situation. Rule number four, turn chaos into order. How do you frame that? How do you take that emergent chaos and make habitable order out of it? You don't know. Is the whole capitalist system rotten to the core? I mean, that's a convenient explanation under those circumstances, that's for sure. Were you working for a psychopathic son of a bitch? Did you make the wrong choice in university and was that your father's fault because you never did what you want or was it your fault for not standing up to him? Or is it a dying industry or is maybe this a wake up call that you should go do something else that you've been waiting to do, you know, that you've actually wanted to do your whole life and that's why you're doing such a miserable job at your current occupation because you're bitter and resentful about the fact that you never did what you want. You don't know, it's all of those things at once. And that's very stressful because all of those things at once is too many things. And that's the reemergence of chaos. That's the flood. That's the return to the beginning of the cosmos. That's another way that it's been represented mythologically. It's that you voyage all the way back to the beginning of the cosmos when there's nothing but undifferentiated chaos. And that's what you're confronting. And maybe it's too much for you. And often it is. I mean, that, that can really, that can be tra traumatizing. It can hurt your brain, you know? It's just too much for you to bear. But it doesn't matter, you're stuck with it. And so how do you respond to that? Well, some of it is catastrophic negative emotion. You freeze and that's protective. And maybe you don't even wanna move. You don't wanna bloody well get out of bed for a week and that's because your body is reacting as if the bedroom floor is covered with snakes and the best thing for you to do is just not move, just freeze. Not a pleasant situation to be in because it's you're hyper aroused very, very physiologically demanding, and there's zero about it that's productive, except maybe the snakes won't see you. But they've already seen you, so that isn't helping very well. So you've got all this undifferentiated negative emotion, anxiety, fear, hurt, anger, guilt, shame, emotional pain, the whole plethora of catastrophes. And then maybe on the other side, lurking down there is, thank God I'm done with that job. I just bloody well hate it. I drag myself off to work every day. And there's a little part of my soul that's so goddamn happy I finally got fired that I can hardly stand it. You know, and maybe you don't even admit that to yourself because, well, that would mean that all that time you spent at the job was just sunk cost. You're deluding yourself the whole time. Um, it is in an interesting thing to consider, though, sometimes if you're in the unpleasant circumstance of having to fire someone. You know, sometimes firing someone is the best thing that can happen to them, which doesn't mean that you should go out and, like, enjoy it. <laughs> Although I have met very disagreeable people who actually enjoyed firing people. I'll tell you a story about that at some point because it's quite interesting. But, you know, sometimes if someone's just limping along in their job and doing it as miserably and wretchedly as they possibly can imagine, the best thing you can do to them for them is to say, you know, you're failing at this. And, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you would have to be failing at absolutely everything else in the entire world. So maybe you should just accept the damn failure and go off and try something new. And I mean, that's terrifying for people and I know they hate it and all that, but, but, but sometimes it's better than the alternative, which is just slow, torturous death. So here's a funny way of looking at it. So let's say you fall right into that hole that's underneath any, everything and you've hit an anomaly that you don't understand. You say, what's that anomaly made out of? Exactly. I know that's a strange way of thinking about it, you know, because it's not, well, you could say, we'll just go along with that. It's a metaphor. What's that anomaly made out of? Well, here's a way of thinking about it. It's made out of spirit and matter. And here's why. This is something I learned in part from Piaget. He said, well, it's made out of matter because, of course, that's the world, matter. And the world is also what matters. And so that's kind of a nice duality there. But it's made out of spirit because when you encounter something anomalous and go down the rabbit hole, when you go into the underworld that's underneath everything that you've relied on, you learn things down there. So what's down there is information. And that now it's maybe way more information than you want, but it is information. It's information. And what can, you, what can you do with the information? You can inform yourself with the information, right? You can put yourself in formation with the information. That's helpful too. And so, and you think, well, 
you, you're a psyche, maybe you're not a spirit, it depends on you know, whether you're a materialist or not, but at least we can say that you're a psyche. The question is, what's your psyche made of? Well, it's obviously got a material substrate, but the, the matter happens to be arrayed in, in a particular order, and that's an information order. And so when you fall into the underworld that's underneath everything and you encounter that latent information, then what you can do is enhance your psyche. You can grow your spirit because what you do is you take the new information and you incorporate it. That's like eating the apple that, that Adam and Eve ate. You incorporate that and that makes more of you. And that's not a metaphorical or a metaphysical proposition. It's, not, it's to say nothing other than, well, that's what happens when children learn. You th think of what happens. Charles III has a pretty low resolution representation of the world and is a fairly low resolution human being. Got all the constituent elements there, but isn't differentiated in any tremendous manner. That's all still to come in the future. And so what does the child do? Explore. Well, what do they explore? Things they don't understand. That's where the information is because you already understand what you understand. There's no information there. You go where there where you don't understand, that's where the information is. And out of that information, you generate a higher resolution world and you generate a higher resolution self. And so out of the combat with the underlying dragon of chaos, you generate spirit and matter. And that's what you do when you go down into the underworld. So if it doesn't kill you, or if it doesn't make you wish you were dead, which it probably will, but there's a bunch of you that has to die down there anyway, so maybe that's not such a bad thing because if you had this relationship that ended in betrayal, then there's something that's just not exactly right, right? There's something that went, and the reason I'm saying that, you think, well, that's kind of moralistic. It's like, actually, I don't mind being moralistic in case you haven't noticed, but, <laughs> but that's not a, it's not a fair comment because you're playing the stupid game. It's like you live with someone in fidelity. That's the game, right? You've decided the rules. With the game comes a morality. The morality are the rules of the game. Well, then the thing collapses into infidelity. It's like, well, you played the game wrong or it was the wrong game. One of those two, you, it's one of those two. You pick the damn game. And having picked the game, you can't all of a sudden say, well, no, those aren't the rules. It's like, yeah, yeah. If you pick the game, you pick the rules. And if you fail at complying with the rules, then you failed. Now, you could say, well, I could pick a different game. It's like, I don't care how you solve the problem. You're still stuck with the problem. It's a moral problem, fundamentally. And it might take some major league retooling to, to fix it. So you're at point A, trying to get to point B. That's not working out. You hit an anomaly. You're not getting to point B, that's for sure. You're a medical school student, you write your MCATs, which is this test you have to write to go to medical school, you get 25th percentile. I don't know who you are, but you're not a pre-med student. And maybe you never were, right? And that's the rub, man. And so, who the hell are you? You don't know. Collapse down here into this motivational conflict, this place of motivational and emotional uncertainty and tremendous information, right? It's a place of transformation. It's the phoenix that burns. It's the burning part of the phoenix that burns. It's, it's the journey to the underworld. It's the journey to hell. It can really be a journey to hell because you may find out that the reason that your partner betrayed you or that you didn't get your damn promotion is because there is seriously something wrong with you and you know it, and I don't just mean that you don't know what you're doing, I mean that there's 25% of you that is seriously aiming at things not being good. And so you fall into the underworld and you find out that, oh, oh God, I just got exactly what I was aiming for. Or I got exactly what the worst part of me was aiming for. And that worst part, that's something to clean up and that's not gonna be easy because it's got its hooks in me like something something ferocious, something seriously ferocious. And I've been toying with it for a very long time and maybe I can't even detach it anymore. And so that's not so fun. And you see people like that in psychotherapy very frequently or you see them wandering around on the streets like absolute catastrophic former shells of themselves, you know, because they've hit the underworld and they ended up in hell and there's no getting out of it. And so those are the people you tend to give a wide berth to when you walk down the street.
Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Rule number five, seek competence. It's a mistake to be fatally cynical about politics because for all the reasons there are to be fatally cynical about politics, there's much more reason to be fatally cynical about the conflict that will inevitably arise or the tyranny that will inevitably manifest itself if we can't handle the dirty business of politics properly. So I would say don't become prematurely cynical about it. The next thing I would say is what do you know? And that's a very important question. It's like, what does it mean to get into politics exactly? Does that mean to seek political power? Does that mean to seek power? Well, first of all, you shouldn't be seeking power. You should be seeking competence. And in order to seek competence, you better know something. And so I would say, well, if you want to get into politics, you want to educate yourself, you know, in, in all the things you need to be educated in life. I mean, you can, you can start to play the political game to familiarize yourself with it, but, you know, it's not such a bad idea to, well, it's not such a bad idea to have a job for a while and, and maybe a career. And maybe it's not such a bad idea to have a successful career upon in which people are dependent on you so that you start to understand what that sort of responsibility means. And then maybe it's not such a bad idea to have a family because like human beings, mature adult human beings tend to have families and, and they transform when they have families because when you have children, then someone becomes more important to you than you are and you're not mature until that happens. And so that's necessary. And so I would say, well, make sure that if you're looking to get into politics, that you're even more looking to get into competence and that you learn everything you can possibly learn that would make you a reasonably wise person by the time you attain whatever level of power you might, authority, let's say, you might be seeking. I mean, I've seen lots of people get into politics. You know, this happens with ideologues and the way they ratchet themselves up the power hierarchy is by being more effective avatars, puppets of their particular ideological stance. And there's nothing about that that's useful. There's nothing in it that will solve any real world problems. And there's plenty that will make it much worse. And so if that's what getting into politics means, I would say stay the hell away from it. But if it's a matter of developing your character and then at some point adopting your social responsibility, then go for it and more power to you because we need people who are competent and careful and truthful and courageous and forthright to enter the political sphere so that things don't degenerate and hopefully have some chance of at least maintaining themselves or improving. So there's... You need, what do you need to know? You, you need to be really good at at least one thing. You have to specialize. You have to be a great networker. You have to know a lot of people. You have to be honest. You have to be articulate. You have to, you have, to have a vision. You have to have a strategy. You have to know something about history and economics and politics. Be good to know something about science. You know, you have to be a polymath of sorts before you should dare to enter that realm with any degree of confidence because otherwise all you are is a loose cannon and you'll come up with global proposals to improve, improve the world, you know, by waving your wand that will do nothing but make everything worse. Rule number six, determine your free will. I want to tell you a little bit about how to conceptualize free will, I think, first because it's obvious that we don't have infinite free will. Our, our, choice, our choices are constrained in all sorts of ways. And I think part of the reason that there's a, a continual discussion about free will in the, philosophical <laughs> in the philosophical literature is because 
just conceptualizing the issue properly is extraordinarily difficult. So I like to think about it, at least in part, the way that you think about a game. You know, if you're playing a game, obviously the game has rules. So if it's a chess game or a basketball game, then there are things that you can do and, and things that you can't do. And but and so it, it's a it's a it's a closed world in some sense. But the fact that there are things you can't do when you play a game also seem to open up a universe of possibilities for things that you can do. So chess obviously constrains you to a board and to a certain number of men and to a certain pattern of rules. But the strange thing is, is that when you put in those rules, because rules sound like limits, they sound always like things you can't do. But when you set up a constrained world like that and you lay out a system of rules, what you do is open up an infinity of of a near infinity of possibilities. Same with music, you know, music has rules, obviously. And, and if you follow the rules, then you can make an infinite variety of music. And so, and so there's, a, there's a very interesting dynamic that's hard to understand between constraint and possibility. And there's a deep idea that's associated with that that I read in some Jewish commentary on, on the biblical stories that I, I read a long time ago. Um, talking about the relationship between God and man, and the idea was that God, imagine a being with the classical attributes of God, omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence, all-seeing, all-knowing, and all-powerful. What does a being like that lack? And obviously the answer is nothing, right? Because by definition, those three traits provide for absence of limitation, but then that's exactly what's lacking, is limitation. And there's some strange connection between limitation and and I was saying say limitation that that's rule governed as I mentioned before and the opening up of possibility so it isn't necessarily the case that now determine determinism and limitation aren't exactly the same thing but they're analogous and they need to be discussed together okay so now so that's the first thing is that our whatever our free choice is it isn't limited it's or it's limited. It's it's deeply limited. Now, here's another thing. If I take my arm and I go like this, you see, I'll do that again. Now, you see there's a movement like that, and then my hands stop just before my my other hand. Now, it takes a certain amount of time for the neural messages to go from my brain to my arm and back. And the time it takes my hand to go like this and stop is actually shorter than the time it takes a message to get to my brain and back. So what that means is that when I, when I plan this movement, which is called a ballistic movement, it's called a ballistic movement because it's like a bullet. Once you let it go, it's gone. There's no calling it back. I've actually organized the neurological and muscular sequences that enable that action before it's implemented. I set all that up and then it's released and the whole thing cascades. And so once the action has been released, let's say, then I don't really have any free will because I can't stop it. Now, so, so you think about that. It looks like there's a temporal gradient with regards to free will is that as you look out into the future, May, perhaps the farther out you look into the future, um, the farther down the road, let's say, the more free your choices are, but the closer they get to implementation, the more they become deterministic, governed by standard causal processes. And there's some transition point where they change from being what we would describe as choice, that we haven't got to free choice yet, but at least to choice, there's some transition point between that and ballistic movement. Rule number seven, pursue your goals. We know enough about psychology now to know that almost all of the positive emotion that you're going to experience in your life, and positive emotion is analgesic, by the way, right? It actually quells pain. So it's not just positive. It also gets rid of negative, which is a big plus. Almost all the positive emotion that you're going to feel, you're going to feel in relationship to a goal because you feel positive emotion as you approach a goal. And so if you want to feel positive emotion, then you need a goal. And then you might think, well, if you want to maximize that positive emotion, which is enthusiasm and also what pulls you out into the world as well as feeling good, then you need the best possible goal. Well, that, because that's going to engage the largest segments of your being. Like if your goal is too narrow, then a bunch of you isn't going to be on board for it, you know? If the goal is well-developed and multifaceted, then all of you can partake in that. Even your negative elements, even your anger and, and, and your fear can get on board with that, let's say. So you need a goal, man, that's 
worthy. You've got to think. You, got, you need a goal that justifies the tragedy and malevolence of life. That seems to be the bottom line. Now, maybe you think, well, there's no goal that can do that. It's like, well, there are still better and worse goals. So, and I, I'm not convinced that there are no goals that can do that. I think that's an open question. You'd never know that until you pursued the proper goal long enough to find out who you would be as a consequence of pursuing it. So that's also your destiny or your existential voyage, right? It's also not something that anyone else can do for you. Someone can say, get your act together for Christ's sake and get, it, get, get at it. That's, that'll make the world unfold best for you, but there's no way you can know that without doing it. So... And unless you think you've done a particularly stellar job of that, then you have no reason to doubt its potential validity. So plus, like crickets are telling you this, and so, <laughs> you know, they're a very reliable source. Okay, so you see the star, the star recurs as a motif in Pinocchio, and one of the more interesting elements of it here is that when Geppetto wants to transform his puppet, the marionette who's being played by forces that operate behind the scenes, which is a really good definition of the persona from a Jungian perspective, right? And also something indicative of something like an ideological or conceptual possession. Geppetto, who's a good guy, is a positive father figure, re lifts his, even though he's a patriarchal figure, right? And a very competent one, he still even lifts his eyes up to something that transcends his mode of being, positive as it is, and wishes that his creation would undertake the kind of transformation that would make it autonomous and fully functional as a moral agent. No strings, right? So that's very interesting, I think. Solzhenitsyn said, the salvation of mankind lies only in making everything the concern of all. That's a pretty decent star-like goal, I would say. And so what happens in the Pinocchio story is that because, and I think this is a symbolic representative of what I just described to you that happens at a genetic level if you put yourself in new situations. So Geppetto is roughly culture in the Pinocchio story, right? He's, he's a craftsman, he's, he's a, and, and he makes Pinocchio. So he's, he's, who's his son? He's the socializing agent. And... He aims for something above mere socialization, which is, I think, part of the mysterious element of human beings. You know, in our scientific models, we basically have socialization and biology. But there's always a third element in mythological stories, which is whatever you might construe as the spontaneous action of consciousness that's associated with free will. And, you know, that's just basically being conceptualized in religious terms as something akin to the soul. Now, we don't have a category for that scientifically because... What we try to do scientifically is to reduce everything either to socialization or to biology. But it isn't clear to me that that's, it's perfectly reasonable from the perspective of practicality at a scientific level. You don't want to multiply explanatory principles beyond necessity. But there's many things that that doesn't come to terms with, such as the fact that we all treat each other as autonomous beings with free will, and that that seems to work, and that if we stop doing that, then things go to hell very, very rapidly. So... And the mere fact that we haven't been able to conceptualize what that conscious free will might be, metaphysically or physically, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means that we don't understand it. I mean, what, it was only in the last 15 years that we discovered that 95% of the universe was made out of some kind of matter that we can't even, whose properties we can't even imagine, except that it seems to have mass. So, anyways, what happens is when Geppetto reached lifts his eyes up to the star. He, so it's society aligning itself with the proper goal with regards to individual development, right? So, so there, instead of society being at odds with the individual, they line up. And then what happens is nature comes on board, and that's the blue fairy in the, in the Pinocchio story. And that seems to me to be a symbolic representation of what happens biologically when, when you set the goal properly get your culture behind you and move into the world, is that there's a biological transformation that occurs as a consequence of that, which means that a bunch of you that hasn't been turned on, turns on. And I guess one question would be is, what would you be like if you turned on everything inside of you that could be turned on? Well, that's a good goal. 
That's a good thing to find out. So, now, I'm going to introduce a couple of other ideas. So, there's this idea in Jungian psychology called the circumambulation. And Jung had this idea that you had a potential future self, which would be, in potential, everything that you could be. And that it manifests itself moment to moment in your present life by making you interested in things. And the things that you're interested in are the things that would guide you along the path that would lead you to maximal development. Now, it sounds like a metaphysical idea or a, or a mystical idea even, but, but it's not. It's, it's not. It's a really profoundly biological idea. The idea is something like, well, you're set up so that you're automatically interested in those things that would fully expand you as a well-adapted creature. Well, like... There's nothing radical about that idea. How el what else could possibly be the case? Unless there's something fundamentally flawed about you, that is what the, the situation would be. It's kind of interesting to think about how that would be manifest moment to moment, but the idea is something like, well, your interest is captured by those things that lead you down the path of development. Well, that better be the case. Okay, so that's fine. And so there's some utility in pursuing those things that you're interested in. That's the call to adventure, let's say. So, and the call to adventure takes you all sorts of places. Now, the problem with the call to adventure is, like, what the hell do you know? You might be interested in things that are kind of warped and bent. And often it's the case that when new parts of people manifest themselves and grip their interests, say, they do it very badly and shoddily. And so you stumble around like an idiot when you try to do something new. That's why the fool is the precursor to the savior from the from the symbolic perspectives, because you have to be a fool before you can be a master. And if you're not willing to be a fool, then you can't be a master. So, so you're going to, it's, it's an error, <clears throat> error ridden process. And that's also laid out in the Old Testament stories, because the first thing that happens to all these patriarchal figures when God kicks them out of their father's house when they're like 84 is that they, they run into all sorts of trouble, and some of it's social, and some of it's natural, and some of it's a consequence of their own moral inadequacy. So they're fools. And, but, but the thing that's so interesting is that despite the fact that they're fools, they're still supposed to go on the adventure, and that they're capable of learning enough as a consequence of moving forward on the adventure so that they straighten themselves out across time. And so it's something like this. So this circumambulation that Jung talked about was this continual we'll return to this, this continual circling in some sense of who you could be. You might notice, for example, that there are themes in your life. You know, when you go back across your experiences, you see you kind of have your typical experience that sort of repeats itself. And there might be variation on it, like a musical theme, but it's, it's like you're, you're circling yourself and getting closer to yourself as you move across time. That's the circumambulation. Now, you remember that for a sec, because we'll go back to it. Okay, so imagine that something glimmers before you. It's an, an interest that's dawning, and you decide, well, first of all, you're paralyzed. You think, well, how do I know if I should pursue that? It's probably a stupid idea. And the proper response to that is, you're right, it probably is a stupid idea, because almost all, all ideas are stupid. And so the, the probability that as you move forward on your adventure that you're going to get it right the first time is zero. It's just not going to happen. And so then you might think, well, maybe I'll just wait around until I get the right idea, and which people do, right? So they're like 40-year-old, 13-year-olds, which is not a good idea. And so they wait around until it's waiting for Godot, until they finally got it right. But the problem is you're too stupid to know when you've got it right. So waiting around isn't going to help. Because even if it, the perfect opportunity manifested itself to you in your incomplete form, the probability that you would recognize it as the perfect opportunity is zero. You might even think it's the worst possible idea that you've ever heard of anywhere. Highly likely. Highly likely. So, so you have, there's, Nietzsche, Nietzsche called that a will, will to stupidity, which I really liked. So, because he thought of stupidity as being, it, you know, it's, it's, you have to take it into account fundamentally, and work with it. And so, and so you can take these tentative steps on your pathway to destiny, and you can assume that you're going to do it badly. And that's really useful, because you don't have to beat yourself up. It's pretty easy to do it badly. But the thing is, it's way better to do it badly than not to do it at all. And that's the continual message that echoes through these historical stories in Genesis. It's like, these are flawed people, 
They, they should have got the hell out of their house way before they did. Um, and they go out and they stumble around in tyranny and famine and self-betrayal and, and violence. And, but it's a hell of a lot better than just rotting away at home. Rule number eight, don't be too harsh on yourself. It's not all that happens, though, when they eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because it's not called the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of nakedness. It's called the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I thought about that for a tremendous amount of time. It's like, what in the world? Because I assume these old stories make sense. You know, it's a game I play. It's like they're old. They've been around a long time. I'm not sure why they're there, but there they are. They're at the basis of our culture. Like many, many of the stories that we depend on depend on them. Our whole culture grew out of their roots, let's say. And so... I assume that our ancestors who managed to survive conditions that would have done a lot of us in very rapidly, I can tell you, were a lot smarter than we think, and that the mysterious processes that, that produced these stories and compelled us to remember them are a lot more psychologically significant than we generally tend to presume. So I give them the benefit of the doubt and try to understand why it is that they might make sense instead of assuming that they don't. And that, that's not easy as their complicated stories. And so I thought about this nakedness, knowledge of good and evil idea for a very, very long time, like about 20 years, puzzling it out. Was, what the hell's the relationship between discovering that you're naked and discovering good and evil? And then one day, mostly because of studying totalitarianism, totalitarianism and the atrocity, the proclivity for people to commit atrocity in the service of their group belief, or maybe just because that's what they were like, um, clued me in. And I thought, I see, this is one of the things that really makes people different than animals. It's like, you know, it's one thing to realize that you're naked. To realize that you're naked means that you know that you're limited in time and space, that you're mortal, and that you're, you're subject to degeneration and to social humiliation and to your own harsh judgment. All of that nakedness, to know that you're vulnerable against the world, and definitely a source of shame um, because of that, um, and, and a, a felt lack of self-sufficiency. And, and no wonder, and no wonder. Um, it's understandable. But the other thing is, is that this is, and this is the rub. It's like, if you're out in the veldt, and you're not being very careful, and a hungry lion jumps on you and eats you, you don't really think of the lion as evil. I mean, you might right at that moment, but... You know, philosophically, it's not evil, it's just hungry. And as soon as it's not hungry, then it goes and has a sleep, and it's not up to some malevolent trick. It's, it's done for the day. But human being, that's a whole different sort of creature. And because human being is capable of doing terrible things to someone else, and consciously so. You think, well, what's the connection between that and nakedness itself? And it seems to be this, is like... Here's the thing, is that once I realize that I can be hurt, you know, I have a self-conscious model of my own vulnerability, then I can generalize that to other people. I can think, oh, this is interesting. Here's how I can be hurt by myself. Here's how I can be hurt by society. Here's how I can be hurt by nature and by the unknown. And what that implies is that, well, you can be hurt with exactly the same mechanisms. And that immediately becomes part of my, what would you say, my repertoire of ability. And then all of a sudden, the, the world is no longer a walled, a walled garden and a well-watered place, but it's a moral story, because with that ability to inflict suffering comes the knowledge of good and evil. As far as I'm concerned, those are identical propositions. Because now we have the choice, a deep choice, about how we're going to treat ourselves and each other. We can inflict tremendous pain and suffering on each other in a very voluntary and, and conscious manner. In, in, in a way that no other animal can manage. And that's the dawning of the moral sense. That capacity we now have to choose to mitigate or exaggerate suffering. And, and that's not all, but it's a huge part of it.
Rule number nine, work on your attractiveness. Physical attractiveness is a very complex trait. Um, it's also, for example, it's a marker of health. And of course, health is a, mar is a prerequisite for success. So um, I, you can't take attractiveness as a unitary dimension and measure it sufficiently accurately. Wait, I should back up on that. No one that I know of has taken physical attractiveness as a unitary concept, measured it accurately, and then pitted it against IQ and the big five to see if it, to what degree it adds incremental validity to the prediction of long-term success. But physical, but, and so I can't give you a technical answer. You know, I can say, well, in a complex job over the long run, IQ accounts for maybe 20% of the variance in success, leaving 80% there for random events and and the big five traits and connection networks and and family background and all those other things gender perhaps that all the other things that determine success physical we know that physical that people who are physically attractive though are given the benefit of doubt by other people they they benefit from the positive halo effect and the positive halo effect is the propensity of people to assume good things about someone if there is one outstanding thing about them that's easily evident that's good and so if you're if you're if you stand up straight with your shoulders back so that's rule one in 12 rules for life then people are going to see you as more attractive if you're symmetrical you're more attractive if you're thin but not too thin you're more attractive um, well, and then there's like good skin and good teeth and good hair and, and all of those things and proper proportions and youth. And there's a whole slew of things that, that, that feed into that. If you are characterized by a plethora of those features, then people are also going to assume that you're more competent and more, um, and more, more worth having around, let's say. But the problem is, is that you are. So separating out the attractiveness from the things the attractiveness are is correlated with is very hard that's why you have to do multivariate analysis that's multi-variable analysis in any complex social science because a lot of these traits overlap so but you know you can you can there's there's some some things you can do about that postural adjustment is helpful to work out with weights that's extraordinarily helpful that that increases improves your posture and makes you more confident and 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 at, and you can dress reasonably well and intelligently and um all of those things to to help yourself capitalize on whatever attractiveness you can muster i'm going number 10 the last one before some very special bonus clips stay sane you need structure you need predictability and you need more of it than you think just to keep you sane now if you're lucky and, and maybe a bit odd, you can deviate 5% from the norm or 10% from the norm or something like that, carefully and cautiously, as long as the rest of you is all well-ordered in a normative manner. You might be able to get away with that and you might be able to sustain it across time and people might be able to tolerate you if you do it, or maybe you'll get really lucky and you happen to be creative but reasonably well put together and people will actually be happy that there's something idiosyncratic and unique about you. But even under those circumstances, mostly what you want is to have a routine that's disciplined, that's predictable, and bloody well stick to it. You're gonna be way healthier and happier and saner if you do that. And then the other thing that you need, because this is one of the things the psychoanalysts got wrong, I think, is that they overestimated the degree to which sanity was a consequence of internal, of being properly structured internally, you know? Because from the psychoanalytic point of view, you're sort of an ego, and that ego is inside you. And of course, it rests on an unconscious structure, but the purpose of psychoanalysis is to sort out that unconscious structure and the ego on top of it, and to make you a fully functioning and autonomous individual. But there's a problem with that, because the reason that you're sane as a fully functional and autonomous human being isn't because you've organized your psyche, even though that's important. The reason that you're sane if, you're a we if you have a well-organized unconscious and ego is because other people can tolerate having you around for reasonably extensive periods of time and will cuff you across the back of the head every time you do something so stupid that people will dislike you permanently if you continue. And so what people are doing to each other all the time, just nonstop, is broadcasting sanity signals back and forth, right? It's like you smile at people if they're 
well, if they're not, not only behaving properly, but behaving in a way that you would like to see them continue to behave, you frown at them if they're not, you ignore them if they're not, you shun them, you, you roll your eyes at them, you manifest a disgust face, you don't listen to them, you interrupt them, you won't cooperate with them, you won't compete with them. It's like you're blasting signals at other people about how to regulate their behavior so frequently, well, it just makes up all of your social interaction. And that's why we face each other and we have emotional displays on our face and we're looking at each other's eyes and we know exactly, we know as much as we can about what's going on with each other given that we don't have immediate access to the contents of their consciousness. And so partly what you're doing with your routine is establishing yourself as a credible, reliable, trustworthy, potentially interesting human being who isn't going to do anything too erratic at any moment. And everyone else is around there tapping you into shape, making sure that that's exactly what you are. And that's how you stay sane. And so what happens to people too, if they don't have a routine and they get isolated is they start to drift. And they drift badly because the world is too complicated for you to keep it organized all by yourself. You just cannot do it. So a lot of our, so we outsource the problem of sanity. And it's very intelligent that we outsource the problem of sanity because sanity is an impossibly complex problem. And so the way that we manage the incredibly complex problem is we have a very large number of brains working simultaneously on the problem all the time. It's like a stock market for sanity. And it's partly, and I use that, I use that definition with purpose because the stock market does the same kind of impossible thing, right? Because it tries to price things, which is impossible. There's a, how many things are there? Like a billion. How in the world do you decide what the price is? You can't decide what the price is. That's why you have a stock market. As, well, in a free market, I mean for, for consumer goods. is Everyone's voting on what the price of everything is all the time. And that's the way we figured out because it's actually, it's technically impossible. That's partly why the stock market explodes now and then and there's bubbles and all that sort of thing. But anyways, the point is, things are chaotic. In Alice in Wonderland, when Alice goes down the rabbit hole, that's the underworld, right? So now she's gone into the substructure of being. And she meets the Red Queen. And the Red Queen is Mother Nature. And Mother Nature is running around yelling, off with her heads, off with her heads which is of course what Mother Nature does. And she tells Alice, in my kingdom you have to run as fast as you can just to stay in the same place. And that's exactly right. And that's a description of, in fact, evolutionary biologists, psychologists have picked up on that phrase. They call it the Red Queen problem. And the Red Queen problem is, everything's after you all the time and you're not smart enough to do anything about it or enough about it. And so that's a permanent existential problem. So how do you deal with that? You've got a biological structure. So your embodiment is part of the solution to the problem. And then you're enculturated. And because you're enculturated, you're taught a lot of things that you need to know, but mostly what you're taught is how to communicate with other people in an acceptable manner. And then once you can communicate with people in an acceptable manner, then you can outsource your problems constantly, which you're doing constantly. And so we're in this continual dynamic exchange of problem solving. So if you're a socialized person, that's what you get access to. And that's something to know if you're going to have kids. And I mentioned this, I think, in a previous lecture. The, pur the purpose of being a parent for very young children is to make your children exceptionally socially desirable by the age of four. Because if you can do that, they're set. Because everyone wants them around. And as soon as everybody wants them around, they want to play with them, they want to cooperate with them, they want to compete with them. It's like the door is open, the door is open, and they stay sane because they've got all sorts of people who actually like them that are helping them out. And so that's your goal, is to make them as socially acceptable as you possibly can, as socially desirable as you possibly can. And that doesn't mean you render them obedient without spirit, right? That's, that's a tyrant's mode of... of enforcing social acceptability. It's like, never do anything wrong. Well, that's not any way to, I mean, that's a good piece of advice, you know, like, but it's missing the other half, which is do a bunch of things that are right so that, so that people are thrilled to have you around and, to, and encourage that. That's what you want to do as a parent as well as inculcating the order. And so, you know, and 
in this little diagram, I indicated that there's God the Father with the Son behind him, and he's ruling over this walled city. So he's like the meta spirit of the walled city. It's very, very nice very nice image, brilliant image. So it's, it's, it's the collective spirit of the city. That's another way of thinking about it, or the collective spirit of the city across time, or the collective spirit of the force that built and maintained the city across time. Even better. And that's associated with the sun because it's, a, it's, it's, it's associated with enlightenment and illumination and all of those things that we associate with higher consciousness and vision. It's a brilliant image. And then I overlaid this, you know. Now, of course, the, the patriarchal aspect of existence can become tyrannical. It does that quite regularly. It's one of the existential dangers of human civilization, is that civilization is a medication for chaos, but it can spin out of control in and of itself and become its own sort of problem, which is like a hyper-order problem generally, which then pr produces a chaos problem. So every solution carries within it certain problems, right? Because no solution is perfect, and so you have to keep things in balance. But it's one of the reasons that I'm really, uh, let's call it irritated, about the postmodernists, because they keep yammering about the patriarchy. And it's very, very annoying, because, because it's self-evident that social structures are tyrannical. It's like, that's not news, folks. That's obvious. But that's not all they are. And it's... It's the, it's the reduction of the entire complex solution, let's say, to a unidimensional problem. It's just ty tyranny. It's like, no, actually, it's not just tyranny. If you spent six months somewhere that was just tyranny, you'd know the difference very, very rapidly. And that doesn't mean that everyone doesn't give up a pound or two or 10 or 20 of flesh to participate even in a society that's as free as a Western society is. We all get crushed and molded by the tyrannical force of social convention. But at least in principle, the benefit is worth the cost. And then it's also up to you to make sure that you don't sacrifice more to the group than you should. And you can start to tell if you're sacrificing more to the group than you should because you start to become resentful of other people. That's part, of the, that's part of the psychological mechanism that's informing you of that. So it's up to you to fight against the, you know, the overarching pressure for conformity to retain your individual logos, let's say, but that's sort of your problem. It's like the group wants you to behave. Now, if you could behave and be creatively productive, so much the better, but that's pretty damn rare. So the group generally tends to settle just for behave. And there's a tyrannical element of that, but what the hell's the alternative? It's, you know, our society is based on consensus and the consensus is based on the sacrifice of, in, a certain sacrifice of individuality, even though individuality is absolutely necessary as a revitalizing force for the society. It's a very tight, touch, tough thing to manage properly. Part of the cultural battle that we all find ourselves enveloped in is partially due to the claim that there's virtually nothing other than the lust for power. And, you know, I would say, fair enough, in some limited sense, which, and that's, that bears directly on your question, because you see that as a temptation that might be powerful enough to bend and distort you as you attempt to make your way through, let's say, the halls of power. Well, I heard recently from a reliable source that Putin's conversion to Orthodox Christianity might be genuine. And then you might think, well, if you're atheistic, well, that's not necessarily a good thing, or maybe you think it's a bad thing, or maybe you think it's an irrelevant issue, and you may also think it's a lie. But I would say that I would be more inclined to trust someone who thinks there's something higher than himself. And then you might say, well, what is it that's higher than ourselves? And that's worth thinking about. And we all need to think about this, regardless of the particulars of our religious belief. And I would say, again, from a clinical perspective, service to others is really something. People who are depressed tend to use the pronouns I and me 
much more frequently than people who aren't depressed. And I'm not saying that people get depressed because they're selfish. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that one of the way out, one of the routes out of depression appears to be an increase in service to other people. And I think the reason for that is because we aren't power mad demons at the core, even though we may be tempted by such things, and that we find the genuine meaning that offsets genuine suffering in the genuine service to others. And I think it's a big mistake to be cynical, especially prematurely, about such things as political activity because they're necessary, despite, let's say, their adversarial and, uh, and uh, party-centered nature, partisan nature. You have to be clear about what you serve and why. And that has to be held higher always than mere victory, mere operationalized victory or instrumental victory. And it's a very, very difficult thing to, to negotiate, particularly because in the political realm, in some sense, you have to defeat your enemy, right? Because you have to win the election and the other people have to lose. It's a binary choice. But so often I see in partisan discussion the proclivity to assume that all the ill will and malevolence resides on the other side of the chamber. And that's a big mistake. And you could think about that more deeply too, is that we all have to put, we all need a place to place the existence of malevolence, right? Because malevolence clearly exists and we're all suffer from the weight of malevolent history, right? Because even the grounds we walk on here, which this is a remarkable and wonderful place, I mean, English soil is soaked with blood, just like the soil of every place in the world. That's part of the human heritage, and all of us bear the marks of that conflict in some sense in our souls, partly because of the possibility for us to engage in that, but also partly because part of the reason we're here in all this privilege is because of all that catastrophe. Well, the best way to localize that malevolence is inside you. Right, and to remember that the enemy that you're fighting with, the greatest enemy that you ever fight with is in your own heart. And that'll also stop you from confusing that true source of malevolence, let's say, with your mere political enemies. And that isn't to say that you won't encounter malevolent behavior, although most of it in the political sphere, as it is everywhere, most of it is more ignorance than malevolence, although willful blindness certainly plays a large role. And so you need to know what it is that you're serving. And I would say one of the ways to do that practically, or a couple of ways to do that practically, is you need a good team around you, the people you really trust, and who can watch you, and who do it with a certain degree of impartiality, and who are disagreeable enough to talk to you when you do something wrong. So you need trusted advisors. And then the other thing I would say is, you really need to listen to your constituents, because they will tell you what the problems are if you listen to them. And if you really listen to them, well, then you'll have your feet on the ground, which is where they should be, and you'll know what the problems are, and you will win elections. Because what people really want from their leaders is to be listened to, and then for those leaders to articulate what they've heard in the halls of, let's say, influence and power. And so if you know those things, if you know you need to listen, you need to get in touch with the people you're representing as regularly as you possibly can, and mostly to listen. Um, I knew a man in Canada who started a political party, which is a very difficult thing to do. And not only did he start it, but he rode it to sufficient success so that he became the leader of the opposition in Canada within about 10 years. And I asked him how he did that, because like, well, really, how did you do that? That's actually really hard. And he said he would go out from constituency to constituency and make his stump speeches, but what he really liked was the Q&As, because people would tell him what their problems were. Then he knew what the problems were. And out of the dialogue would also emerge the answers that the audience found compelling. And so not only would they tell him what the problems were, but they would tell him the answers they would like to have, it, have, have what instituted to solve those problems. Uh, it's the same thing that comedians do when they, when they finesse, finesse their acts in front of live audiences before they practice them in front of a large audience. They, lit, they tell jokes. and. The audience either laughs or they don't. And if they laugh, then you keep that joke, and if they don't, you throw it out. And soon you're just as funny as the audience can possibly manage. And it's the same thing. You can also do that in a dark manner, by the way, which is what Hitler did. So he could utter terrible things and wait for a response and collect those. 
And so then you become the embodiment of the shadow of your people. So I would recommend that you probably don't do that. You go to a party, your heart's beating. Why? The party is a monster. Why? Because it's judging you. And it's judging you, it's putting you low down the dominance hierarchy, because that's what a negative judgment is. And that interferes with your sexual su success. And that means that you're being harshly evaluated by nature itself, right? So you are confronting the, the dragon of chaos when you go into the social situation. And so what do you do? You're like this, right? You hunch over, and that's low dominance. I'm no threat. It's like, well, that's not gonna get you very far. You know, but that's a logical thing to do in, in, the, in, in the face of a tyrant. So I'm no threat. You know, you look at the king and you're dead. I'm no threat. I'm hunched over. And then what's happening internally? How are, what are people thinking about me? What are people thinking about me? Am, am I looking stupid? Am I looking foolish? Geez, I'm awkward. I hate being here. Man, I'm sweating too much. It's all internalized, right? It's all self-focused. The, the, the eye isn't work, the eye isn't working. What do you tell people? Stop, don't stop thinking about yourself, because you can't. It's like, don't think of a white elephant. White elephant, white elephant, white elephant. You can't tell someone to stop thinking about something because they get caught in a loop. What you do with socially anxious people is you say, look at other people. Look at them, right? Why? Because if you look at them, you can tell what they're thinking. And then you, you're, unless, you're, unless you're terribly socialized, and some people are, some people have no social skills. And so the reason they can't go to a party is because they don't even know how to introduce themselves. Like they're just, no one ever taught them how to behave. And so they're really good candidates for behavior therapy because you walk them through the process of how you actually manifest the procedures that are associated with social acceptability. But most people aren't like that. They have the ability. So if they're really introverted and high in neuroticism, they can usually talk quite well to someone one-on-one. -on -one. Why? Because they look at them. Well, if I look at you, it's another thing to do if you're ever speaking to a group of people. Never speak to the group of people. It doesn't exist. You talk to individuals. And then they reflect for you the entire group. Because they're all entrained. So you look at one person, they broadcast to you what everyone's thinking, and you know how to talk to one person. So it's easy. And so as soon as you focus on the person, not you, you push your attention outward, you use your eye, you push your attention outward, and you start watching. Well, then all your automatic mechanisms kick in, and you stop being awkward. Because if we're talking, and I'm looking here, I don't know what you're gonna do next, and I'm gonna put disjunctions into the, like, they're like, uh, bad chords in the melody of our, of our conversation. And the reason is I'm not paying attention. So that's why the eye is the thing at the top of the pyramid. It's like the thing that enables you to win the set of all possible dominance hierarchies is the eye. Pay attention. Pay attention. That's the critical issue. That's why the Egyptians worshipped Horus. That's why Horus was the thing that rescued Osiris from the, from the depths. It's the capacity to pay attention. What do you pay attention to most? what your right hemisphere signals as anomalous. It, it, it attracts your attention. It's like, this isn't going quite right. I'm not looking at that. Wrong. That's what you look at. That's what you look at. What's not going right, because that's, see, that's the terrible monster that might eat you, but it's also the place you get all the information. So, that's why it's useful to have discussions with your enemies because they will tell you things you do not know. And that's such a great thing, because if you don't know them, well, you're not very smart, are you? You know, there may be a time when you go somewhere that that's the thing you need to know. And maybe your enemy will tell you why you're such a fool, you know, and a bunch of other things that aren't true, too. But even one thing that's accurate, it's like, yeah, thanks very much, man, maybe I'll do some work on that, and I won't have to carry that forward. So, and then that's part of the reason, again, why the terrible predator, it's always the terrible predator that has the gold. It's like, it's the person who delivers the message you do not want to hear. So it's rough, it's rough, but it doesn't matter. Life is rough. If you're looking for certainty, the reality of suffering is certain. I mean, what do you accept as evidence above all else? That's a good question, that's a hard question, but I would say pain is up there. It's very difficult not to believe in the reality of your own pain. Um, it's somewhat easier not to believe in the reality of other people's pain. That's not so easy either, you know, um, but it's, 
your, your pain seems to be undeniably real. And so it does beg a question, which is, you know, if pain is undeniably real, is that which overcomes pain even more real? And I think that's, in some sense, that's the idea that lurks behind the idea of the resurrection. I don't know how many of you have read Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, but I would highly recommend that in Crime and Punishment, the protagonist commits the perfect murder. And he has his reasons for it, and, mo and many reasons, because Dostoevsky didn't mess around when he wanted to give someone reasons, he gave them reasons. And Raskolnikov, the main character, had reasons for murder. And then he commits his murder, and he gets away with it. But things don't go well for Raskolnikov, because one of the things he finds out is that the Raskolnikov that you were before you committed the murder is not the same as the Raskolnikov as you are after you've committed the murder. And there's a dividing line there that you don't, it's like the red pill, I guess, right? It's in, like, it, that's the matrix, correct? The red pill? And once there's certain actions, once you take them, there's no going back. And so that's what crime and punishment is about. And Raskolnikov tortures himself to death, well, not literally, but metaphysically, psychologically, because he cannot tolerate breaking the great moral code. And so it's, it's a great book. It's truly a great book. And, and, and it's also extraordinarily, like it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a murder mystery thriller as, as well as being a deep philosophical book. So if you're in the mood for, you know, a murder mystery thriller that's also a deep philosophical book, then that's the one for you. You speak about the concept of the soul. Um, do you associate this with any psychological constructs? Not any psychological constructs that are more valid than the notion of the soul. You know, there's, there's, I would say, what we mean by soul is something like animating spirit. And you might say, well, what's a spirit? And, well, that's actually rather easy to answer, so... When a child of four is playing house, let's say when a child of four is playing house, she acts out the role of the mother. But acting out, that's a strange thing, right? Because she doesn't literally duplicate in her actions or her perceptions in the game what she observed her mother literally doing. So for example, she didn't go into her mother's bedroom when her mother awoke and watched her turn her head in a particular way to awaken and count the number of blinks so that she could mimic that in her play. And you know, you think that's absurd, but it's not absurd if it's just mimicry. It's not. It's unbelievably sophisticated. So what the girl does is she watches her mother manifest maternal behavior across a vast array of instances, and she integrates that with the image of the mother she's received from all the books she's been read and all the little movies she's watched, the Disney movies and so forth, and she abstracts out the animating principle of the maternal, and then she embodies that in play, and usually with a little boy, and that's practice for what's going to come later. It's unbelievably sophisticated, and she's embodying a spirit, and the spirit there is the abstraction of the central animating principle from multiple embodiments of its manifestation. And if you think children can't do that, well, then you don't know anything about children because they do that all the time in their pretend play, which is a necessary precursor to healthy psychological development. And so part of what we refer to as the soul is the presence of that spirit, or maybe even the capacity of embodying such spirits. And it's very difficult to know how deep that goes. You know, I had a vision at one point of all the men in my life who've been particularly influential in a benevolent way, you know, and so, and you think, well, just a mere notion of the idea that there could be a benevolent way that would unite the acts of benevolence across a series of men, that's all comprehensible to you. That's, you take that as a matter of course when you say that there are such things as good men, and you can identify them, right? Something stable about whatever is good across multiple manifestations of, of incarnation, let's say. And I saw that transform into the, the father person of the Trinity as the embodiment of that benevolent spirit. Now, I don't have any idea what that means metaphysically, because who does? But, but that... That spirit manifesting itself within is certainly part of what we refer to when we talk about the soul. And you can see that shine through people. 
I mean, it's part of what gives someone charisma. It's part of what elicits the instinct to imitate in you. You know, when you see that even in simple things, when you see a remarkable athlete do something incredibly athletic to put the goal, to put the soccer ball, the football ball through the net, to score the goal and everybody leaps to their feet in celebration of that, well, that's, that's a celebration of the divine capacity to hit the target dead on. And it grips you at such a, lo a low level, way down inside your soul, that you're compelled to your feet to cheer, and you don't even know what you're doing. But you enjoy it, that's for sure, and that enjoyment is also a sign of the depth and utility of that response. You see this in all, all the things that people do that are you know, so-called popular entertainment. It's unbelievably sophisticated. The soul is participating in that in the fullest extent. And, you know, you can say, well, there's no use for the religious, there's no necessary use for the religious terminology. It's like, well, until you come up with a better word, there's plenty of use for it because it's a very complex and deep phenomena. And to, you know, just cast it into the realm of superstition in some casual manner is... It's just not helpful, not in any possible, it's not helpful scientifically, it's not helpful ethically, it's not helpful existentially. Try treating someone for a while as if they don't have a soul. Just really, I mean it, just, you know, treat them like a deterministic machine, if that's your belief. Really act it out. You'll be like the most hated person in town in about 15 <laughs> minutes. Well, I mean, what do you make of practical evidence like that? I mean, you interact with people as if they're free souls capable of choosing between good and evil. That's what you do all the time. And maybe you can addle yourself out of that by some ridiculous rationalist ideology, but that just means you're kind of a gabbling fool, and it's just going to make you trip over things you don't even notice in all of your social interactions. And you tell me, I don't care how you think philosophically or ideologically, you bloody well know that what I just said is true. So, and that's true even when you're interacting with an infant or a small child. It's true when you're dealing with someone who's elderly and, and virtually incapacitated in every way. You still see that divine spark, for lack of a better term, and we do lack a better term, by the way. You see that everywhere if your eyes are open and if you're willing to see it, and to the degree that you're responsive to that, then your actions are guided by love and your words are guided by truth. When you organize your perceptions around a goal, and that provides a container for your negative emotion. So if I want to walk across the stage because I think that getting to the other side is preferable to being here, so that's a hierarchy of value, that place is better than this place, then when I observe myself undertaking the actions that will get me to that place, that's comforting and provides security because it shows that the structure that I'm using to organize my perceptions and to reduce the world to a manageable, to manageability is sufficiently accurate so that I can implement it. And so we seem to inhabit those structures all the time. Whenever we're looking at the world, whenever we're interacting, we specify a goal, and so that's an ethical enterprise, and we organize our emotions within the specification of that goal, and then we produce hierarchies of goals. So, you know, you go to, you, you sit down in front of your computer so you can write a paper and you write a paper so that you can finish an essay and you finish an essay so that you can get a grade in a class and get a grade in a class so that you can graduate with a degree and you do that so that you can get a job and you do that so that you can be, what, a good husband, a good wife, a good citizen and you do that so you can be a good person. There's a hierarchy of ethic that permeates the entire enterprise right from the microcosm up to the macrocosm, and I think that's something like the whole landscape of religious value with the outermost container, so be a good person, let's say that's the ultimate aim of the religious enterprise, that's something like the imitation of Christ in the most fundamental sense, and all the things that you do within that are a reflection of that, or you're confused and chaotic. And if everyone's doing that at the same time, then you have a society that's integrated and aiming up and capable of telling the truth. It's something like that. Does that seem reasonable? And so, so what's the proposition here? Well, I think when we describe these frameworks of perception, 
the name we give to the description of a framework of perception is a story. And I think the reason that we like stories so much is because we need to establish frameworks of perception in order to operate in the world and to allow ourselves to be integrated peacefully with other people. And so we're extraordinarily interested in anything that has a narrative basis. And the reason we're interested in that is because we're trying to build within ourselves and collectively the structure that enables us to perceive the world without undue confusion and chaos and in a manner that provides some value to us and some sustainability. That's the goal overall. And that seems to me to be the goal of the entire religious enterprise. And so is it possible that, well, I guess that's, as, that's the claim I thought I'd elaborate out a little bit today, is that the Bible is true in a very strange way. It's true in that it provides the basis for truth itself. And so it's like a meta-truth, right? Without it, there, without it, there couldn't even be the possibility of truth. And so maybe that's the most true thing. The most true thing isn't some truth per se, it's that which provides the precondition for all judgments of truth. And it seems to me that I can't see any holes in that argument. And I can't see any holes in it from a scientific perspective either, because I think we do know well enough now as scientists that the problem of deriving ethical direction from the collection of facts is an intractable problem. There's too many facts. There's an infinite number of facts. They do not provide an unerring guide for action. They can't. There's too many of them. They have to be prioritized. And as soon as they are prioritized, well, then you're in the ethical domain. And then that begs the question, what's the valid ethical domain? And the postmodern answer is, well, there isn't one. It's all the expression of domination and power. And I, I think that's nonsense. I, I don't think that's a tenable solution. I think that we stumbled onto the proper answer in some sense in our religious enterprise, which is that we aim at what's highest, or, or we don't. We aim at what's highest jointly, or we're divided. We aim at what's highest, and that gives meaning to all the things we do that are subordinate parts of that. We aim at what's highest, and that's what collects us and gives us structure, all of that, you know, singly and jointly. And that's all what we've been trying to communicate all these centuries as we've been trying to communicate the whole religious corpus, generation after generation, and to sort this out and to straighten it out and to try to understand it. And uh, I think that's where we're at now, you know. Pick something, aim at it. As you move toward it, you'll get wiser. Then maybe your aim will change. That's okay, but at least it'll change in an informed way. It's like discipline yourself in one dimension. See what happens. Well, that's exciting. And I think that's something that's open for everyone. You can do that. I shouldn't say that because I don't believe that. I think you can find yourself in a situation that's so dire that you don't. there's no escape from it. But that doesn't matter because the best we have might not always work, but it's still the best we have. And the fact that it might not work doesn't mean we should throw it away. It's still the best we have. I mean, everyone dies, and so we fail in some sense. The fact that a symphony ends doesn't mean that it wasn't worth listening to. Responsibility. That's what gives life meaning. It's like lift a load. Then you can tolerate yourself, right? Because look at you're useless, easily hurt, easily killed. Why should you have any self-respect? That's the, the story of the fall. Pick something up and carry it. Pick, make it heavy enough so that you can think, yeah, well, useless as I am, at least I could move that from there to there. Well, what's really cool about that is that when I talk to these crowds about this, the men's eyes light up. And that's very, like I've seen that phenomenon because I've been talking about this mythological material for a long time. And I can see when I'm watching crowds, people, you know, their eyebrows lift, their eyes light up because I put something together for them. And that's what mythological stories do. So I'm not taking responsibility for that. That's what the stories do. So I say the story and people go click, click, click. You know, and their eyes light up. But this responsibility thing, that's a whole new order of this, is that young men are so hungry for that, it is unbelievable. And one of the things I've been talking to some of the people who've been um, running for the conservative leadership in Canada, and I've been talking to them about well, the difficulties they have communicating with young people because conservatives, what, what the hell are they gonna sell to young people, right? Because being conservative is something that happens when you're older. They can sell responsibility. 
You need that instinct for meaning too. So, and, and we should get this real straight. Why do you need it? Well, you need it because life is really, really difficult, right? I mean, people have a rough time of it. There's plenty of suffering in life and everyone is going to encounter it, right? They're, they're, you, don't, you, know, you learn this as a clinical psychologist and you know this generally, you know, unless you're an extraordinarily fortunate person. Um, you don't have to talk to someone for very long and, and really talk to them and get beneath the surface until you find, you know, there's a tragedy or two or three or 10 lurking not very far beneath the surface. Someone in the family is very ill. There's a childhood history of extreme pathology, alcoholism somewhere in the family, maybe a touch of insanity. Someone has cancer. You know, someone, some an older relative is dying. There's financial trouble. There's economic trouble. There's marital trouble. It's like life is trouble. And now, you know, it, it, that doesn't mean it's all trouble, but man, it's trouble. And sometimes it's, it's a lot of trouble. And sometimes it's so much trouble that you can, you can barely stand it. And, and you see that because people, you know, people get depressed and they commit suicide. And the reason they do that is because they think not being is better than being. And that's quite the decision, you know? So, and, and it's not that uncommon among people who are depressed. And so it's, it's, a, it's a very, it's a very, important thing to consider. And it, and it isn't just a matter of depression and suicide, that's bad enough. But you know, if you're unhappy because your suffering has pushed you past the point of your ability to cope, then there's all sorts of other things that can happen to you that aren't directed towards you. You can become cynical and you can become bitter and you can become cruel and you can become narcissistic and deceitful and arrogant and, and it's like, everything's for you, and then you're out for revenge. That's a nice one. I don't know against who, but maybe everyone. Maybe even including you, because you're not happy about the role you've played in generating your own misery. I mean, there's a lot of darkness underneath the suffering, and, so, and, and, and that's, that's an ever-present existential danger for human beings, you know? We're aware of the future, we're aware of our fragility, we're aware of our mortality. It's something that makes us truly unique truly conscious in a way that no other creature is and capable of things that no other creature can do, but also bearing an unbelievably heavy existential load. We're the only creatures that have to always contend with the fact that we're finite and that everyone we know is in the same position, that allied with the suffering. And so that's there all the time. And, and you know, even, even in, in the brightest moments in some sense, you know, in, in, in Renaissance paintings, in, in still lifes, they used to put a memento, a memento mori often in the, in the still life, like a skull somewhere in the corner, or sometimes, sometimes in, a, in, in a very strange perspective so that you could only see the skull if you were standing like right beside the painting instead of dead on. But the idea was to always remember, you know, that everything that exists is tainted or touched with the, with the, with the, with the, with the taint of mortality. And, you know, that's rough, but there, there's some useful things in it. It keeps you awake and it, it keeps you focused if you're careful, but it also does indicate to you, if you think about it, the necessity of having a meaning in your life. Because, because if it's true intrinsically that life has this unbearable element of suffering, which seems to be completely in, in what would you say, indisputable as far as I'm concerned, and it's worse than that too, because it's not just suffering, it's suffering contaminated with malevolence, right? It's, it's bad enough to have something bad happen to you, and it's likely that that'll happen. But it's even worse for you to do it to yourself and to know that you did it. That's rough. And it's also extraordinarily rough to be betrayed by someone else or, you know, tyrannized by your own culture. And so, and that's, that's not just suffering. That's like unnecessary and pointless suffering that's been directed at you by something that wants that to happen. And so both of those are very, very powerful, let's say, archetypal forces, suffering and malevolence, and we have to deal with them at every level of reality. And you need something to, you need something to push back against that. It's not optional if that's the default position, and I think it's the default position. Like, a meaningless life isn't meaningless. It's suffering and malevolence. That's not good. And, and if that's acted out, you know, that, that's the other thing. If that's acted out, and I, I've read the accounts and the actions of people who've taken a very vicious turn into the darkest parts of the underworld 
consequence of their resentment and their malevolence and then their desire to make everything in the world suffer for the outrage of its existence, man. I mean, that's how we turn things into hell. If you want to know why totalitarian states take the brutal twists they take and why people are motivated to do the absolutely terrible things that they do, well, that's why, is that the suffering and the malevolence that's intrinsic to life overwhelms them and and they turn and they turn in a very bad direction and then they make everything that's already bad way worse and we're very, very inventive at such things. And so that's not good unless that's the path you want. That's a bad idea. You need an alternative and that's meaning. Human consciousness is that faculty that confronts potential itself. I think there's good neurological evidence for this, by the way, for those of you who are scientifically minded because Uh, We build circuits within us for habitual action that we've practiced many times that seem to run in a very deterministic fashion. And we are a strange combination of deterministic and non-deterministic as far as I can tell. But what our consciousness seems to be for is to encounter those things that we have not yet encountered. And those things that we have not yet encountered seem to me to be those things that have not yet been brought into being. And so you could say that what our consciousness is for is for the encounter with potential. You know, that our consciousness is for the, it's not for the past, it's not even for the present. It's to transform the future into the present. And and really that that's what our consciousness does. When you wake up in the morning, you have a new day ahead of you and the day could take you in very many directions. and and the weeks and the years, all of that can take you in very many directions and you have some apprehension about what those directions might be. You have some apprehension about what role your choices might make in transforming that potential into one form of actuality or another. I mean, you certainly know that there are dreadful mistakes that you might be very tempted to make that would produce all manner of hell around you and still be tempted to do it. It seems like it's sitting there right in front of you as a possibility. You also know that, you know, you could haul yourself up out of bed and attend to your duties and do the sorts of things that you're supposed to and set a few things right that day and that week and that likely things would at least not be worse and they would probably be better. And uh, I, I believe that, I do believe that, I, I don't understand how this can be the case. I don't understand how it is that consciousness, consciousness can function in that way. Because I think to understand that, we would have to understand what it means for the future to be only potential rather than actuality. And who the hell understands that? I mean, no one. And then we'd have to understand how it is that our conscious choices and our conscious ethical choices transform that potentiality into actuality, into reality, into the present and the past. And we certainly, well, we certainly act as if we believe that that's what we do. We upbraid ourselves. For example, when we do a bad job of it, we're upset with our children and those we love if we don't believe that they're living up to their potential. We're guilty and ashamed when we make choices that we feel are inappropriate. We understand to some degree that the manner in which time lays itself out has something to do with the ethics of our choice. And again, I would say that's a very deep idea. I think it's, a, I think it's, I think it's the most true idea I know. It's very emphasized, that idea emphasized in ancient religious stories such as those that are outlined in Genesis or in Genesis with its strange insistence that, you know, God is that which brings order out of chaos, formless potential, generates the world out of formless potential, and that we're somehow made in that image, which, which seems to me to be the case. And that the proper way, by the way, to go about acting in that image is to act in relationship to the potential that confronts you with truth and with courage, with careful articulation, that's the logos, and that if you do that, then what you bring forth is, is good. When you see people who are noble in spite of their suffering, it is ennobling, it is uplifting. Re- like, really, it is. And, um, and it, it's been striking to me, too. People want to be encouraged in that direction. I mean. 
part of the reason that my lectures, I would say, have been successful to the degree that they have been is because people find them encouraging. Mm -hmm. And that actually seems to work, like it seems to be positive. Because it, it isn't it necessarily good news. Well, it seems to be. I yeah. mean, it isn't necessarily the case that that would be the case, you know, because it could have been that I would have said encouraging things to people. There's more to you than meets the eye, and you're capable of more than you're demanding of yourself. And, you know, if you took on your responsibility and faced the things that you're trying to avoid, that your life would be richer and better and for you and for everyone around you. And the result of that could have been that thousands of people would come to me and say, you know, I gave that a pretty good shot and it, your advice is really awful and everything is, well, seriously, like I took on that responsibility. It just bloody crushed me and I'm way worse off than I was before and everything's gone to hell around me and like, thanks a lot, buddy. And that, and that it's not like that's a completely incomprehensible possibility. But that doesn't seem to be what happens, is what generally happens is that young people in particular, but not only, come to me and say, look, I've been trying to take on more responsibility and to face the things I've been avoiding, and everything is way better. It's like, okay, well, hmm, isn't that something? Maybe and, I'm something. Well, then you ask yourself, well, what's the limit of that? Because that's the religious question, fundamentally, is, well, if you took on all the responsibility you could take on, and you faced everything that you needed to face, what would you be like? Who would you be? And how would the world transform around you? And well, if, if the partial answer is, well, if I do that a little bit, things get a fair bit better, then the next question might be, well, what if you did that completely? And I don't think that's possible in some sense, right? It's like, you know, perfection is a horizon that always recedes, but it isn't obvious to me what the upper limit of that is, and certainly we do see people, I mean, saints, let's yeah, that's say. that's what you say, it's a Mother right, Teresa, who, it's a Francis who, of Assisi. Who kind of push the limit, and they, miraculous things happen around them, and maybe in the literal sense, and if not in the literal sense, close enough, you know, for all intents and purposes, and so that's heartening. I mean, I tear myself apart about this in many ways, because I think, Perhaps it's possible to take on too much responsibility and to crush yourself as a consequence. Maybe that's a sin of pride. Who knows? It's certainly possible. But my experience so far has been that when you see people bear their suffering nobly, there's nothing in that but good. That's something. And then when you see people take on more responsibility and decide that they're going to aim up and... and confront their suffering honestly and forthrightly, that their lives get better and the lives of people around them get better too. And so it's, that's very strange as well because it also means that the pathway to less suffering is through suffering, right? And that's kind of, that would be hopeful if the world was constituted that way. It's like, well, there's suffering. How do you make it worse? Run away. How do you make it better? Confront it. Yeah, but it's suffering. It's like, yeah, but it's there. There it is. It's right there. It's a precondition for existence or something like that. And it's like you have something important to do as well. And you confront it. And that's the pathway to transcending it. You look where you think it's important to look. So I'll say that again. You look where you think it's important to look. And that means that, well, in, a hierarchy of importance is no different than a hierarchy of value. They are the same thing. A hierarchy of priority is the same as a hierarchy of value. And a hierarchy of priority and a hierarchy of value and an ethic are all the same thing, right? Because you're gonna look at what you believe to be of cardinal importance. Otherwise you look well. If you're talking to someone and you look at their feet, that's not going to be going very well, right? First of all, they're not gonna be very impressed with you because they actually want you to look at their eyes. And that's because we communicate value with our eyes and we do that directly. Our eyes have even evolved to do that. Our eyes have whites around the iris so that you can see where people point them because it's that important to know what people think is important. We see the world through a structure of value. And I think that a huge part of that structure of value is actually derived from the entire set of texts entire set of texts and their interrelationship that have the biblical corpus at their base. And so it seems to me that you, I think you can make a pretty damn strong case 
maybe on scientific grounds, that you can't see the world except through the lens of the Bible. Like literally, you actually can't see it. Now, if it's not the Bible, it might be some other corpus of texts, but it might be. It isn't. And if it was, well, is it gonna be a corpus of texts that we share? Because if it isn't, then we can't share our perceptions and our values, and if we can't share those, then we fight. Those are the options, right? We either stabilize our hierarchies of value in some way that we agree upon mutually, or we fight. That's, or we're unbelievably chaotic and confused, and that'll just produce fighting in any case. And so, we have this structure of texts built from the bottom up. It's predicated on the biblical narratives, and the texts exist in relationship to those underlying narratives, and derive a fair bit of their meaning from the meaning of the underlying narratives, and and vice versa, you know. Um, and so then, the biblical, is it possible that biblical truth is the sort of truth that is the precondition for truth? Right, because you think, well, it's religious people make the claim, people of the Bible make the claim, the Bible is true. Well, there's all sorts of different kinds of truth. That's, that's an interesting claim, but it's not very elaborated. It's, it's insufficient. Um, and you know, often what happens to Christians when they debate skilled atheists like Richard Dawkins is they treat the Bible like it's a scientific theory and Dawkins just mops the floor with them because it's actually not a scientific theory compared to scientific theories. And so as soon as you go there, well, it's like a scientific theory. It's like, no, it's not. It's not. And so does that mean it's not true? Well, it means that if the only thing you think is true is a scientific theory, but I don't think that you can practice science except within an ethical framework that's not in itself science. And so it's possible that there is a deeper truth than the scientific truth, which is the ethic that has to be there a priori before you can even begin to do science. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you are different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end, and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video. I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. For 10 more amazing rules from John Asraf, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe. See you then. A lot of athletes, you know, have this term around the A game and showing up and doing their absolute best mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, etc. And it got me thinking about do you even know what your A game is?